$100,000, we'll place your name on a special founder's wall at both buildings in Israel. And as a special gift of appreciation, we'll send you a personalized crystal plaque. When you send your gift of $100 or more, we'll send you a special founder's certificate honoring your investment in this project. And everyone who responds with a gift of $50 or more to help provide housing for the Holocaust survivors may request a new expanded edition of Jensen Franklin's book, Right People, Right Place, Right Plan, along with accompanying devotional. Every gift counts. Together, we can be a blessing to Israel and see God's everlasting covenant of blessing come into your life. Call now or visit us online at jensenfranklin.tv. I want to talk to you about the right people, the right place, the right plan. And I want you to receive because I do, I do believe that I have faith for what I'm preaching, that there can be impartation, more than a service, more than a sermon. There can be impartation into your life today. That's really what I feel. So I'm going to share what's on my heart. It is so critical to get the right voices in your life because if you don't get the right voices, you will not make the right choices. If you don't understand and make the right connections in life, you will not reach the right destinations. And everything is connected. You've got to have the right people if you're going to have God's blessing upon your life. Because God uses people. Nobody has ever received a check signed Jehovah Jireh. <laughs> he used somebody. I know God's your source, but he used somebody. And we need... We need to pray for those power relationships in our life. A power relationship is God blessing you for transition. When, when God wants to transition you from one place to another place, he will put in your life what I call kingdom connections or power relationships. People many times who have done what you're trying to do, already been through what you're going through, and they have the ability to reach back and grab you and pull you through and expedite your journey in amazing ways. And it's all about who you get around. Something else about the right people, they, have, they can unlock the potential that is inside of you. If you get around the right people, they can unlock the potential that God has put in you. Some people, you know, have the opposite effect. They kill your dream. They, they, they will cause you to abort the purpose and the plan and the, and the thing that God has put in your heart to do. But there are other people like when Mary got around Elizabeth, the Bible said that John the Baptist, the baby was in her womb and he started leaping. There are some people that will cause you to abort the baby you're supposed to give birth to, spiritually speaking. And there's other people, if you get around the right people, they'll make that baby leap. They'll make that dream say, yes, I can do it because God's told me. And that's just a, and they're feeding that part of you. And so that's why it's so critical to get the right people in your life. Somebody is already on the level that you're trying to get to. And one kingdom connection, one power relationship can change everything. That's why I think it's so important that every day of our life, we get up and we pray for 2020 discernment in the spirit. That we understand that when God wants to bless you, he will send a person. And when the devil wants to curse you, he will send a person. But either way, it's going to be a person. And that's why you need that 2020 discernment to tell and discern the people who are supposed to be in your life. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 8, he said, No, no man after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And he, they that are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. And they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Meaning this, flesh people feed your fear. But spirit people feed your faith. Flesh people tear you down. But faith people build you up. Flesh people drain your energy. They, they, they waste your time. They make you go around the mountain one more time. But spirit people make your baby leap, your dream leap. They speak to something inside of you that releases your potential and causes you to have great purpose and great calling 
on your life. I call these people kingdom connections, power relationships. For example, when Saul of Tarsus needed a life change, God put into his life a man by the name of Ananias. Ananias was the right man in the right place at the right time. And God said, go lay your hands on that man. He's a chosen vessel. I know he doesn't look like it, but you are going to be the, the, the power relationship in his life that turns his life around. And Ananias went and laid hands on Paul. And your Bible said that the scales fell off of his eyes. All of us need somebody in our life that, 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 that when they pray and talk to us, we see things right. We start seeing things in the way that we ought to see them, not just like we're stubbornly seeing them. You're blessed when God brings into your life someone who can help you see right. The scales fell off of his eyes. And Saul of Tarsus became, by the power of God, the great Apostle Paul, who would go and do so many amazing things. When he wanted to start preaching, the Bible said that nobody in the church would allow him, would give him a chance to preach because they were terrified. He had persecuted Christians and killed them. And so the Bible said there was a man by the name of Barnabas, again, a kingdom connection, a power relationship, the right man in the right place at the right time. And Barnabas had something in him. Watch now. He says to the churches, I want you to have him on my behalf. I am setting up and I'm telling you, I stand behind him and I want you to trust me. He has no clout. I do. He has no influence. I do. And I'm using my influence, my clout, my credibility. I'm telling you, this man has something to say. And he opened the door like a bridge became the opportunity that Paul got to go where he could have never gone by himself because he had a power relationship, a kingdom connection, a man in his life who said, I'm going to open doors for you that you cannot open for yourself. Let me tell you when you get blessed is when you start believing and seeing that God has people who can knock the scales off of your eyes and God has people who can bridge you into circumstances and places that you could never get yourself. Your name is not known there. Nobody's ever heard of you. Nobody knew that Paul could preach like he could preach. But here comes this man and he says, I'll be a power relationship, a kingdom connection. And later the apostle Paul got so discouraged after going through tremendous warfare and trials that he said in second Corinthians seven, listen to this. I had fightings on the outside and I had fear on the inside. Have you ever had a day like that? fightings on the outside. There's so much stuff going on out here in the, in, in, on my job, in the family, this fightings on the outside. And even worse than that is fear on the inside, doubting my own ability, doubting my own faith, doubting my own mind, doubting my own uh, talent. Do I, do I have what it takes? You, that's a bad day when the enemy's not just fighting you externally, but internally fighting on the outside, fear on the inside, but listen to what God did to get him through this rough season where he was about to quit. He said, nevertheless, God sent Titus to me and he encouraged me in the work of the Lord. Isn't that amazing that God would use a little nobody, no, nothing guy that nobody's ever heard of. But Paul said, I want to tell you about Titus. He encouraged me when I was about to give up, when I was about to quit, when I was about to throw in the towel, God gave me a power relationship of encouragement and he encouraged me in the Lord. I'm telling you today that God has the right people. If you're discouraged, you just start looking. God will start sending people. If you don't know which direction to go, God can send somebody to knock the scales off and it was there all the time. You just couldn't see it. And if you are in a situation and you can't get your foot in the door, you can't get in. Seems like you're blocked out and the doors are shut. God says, I've got for you those right people like Barnabas who can bridge you over and open doors that you cannot open for yourself. How many of you would like to have some kingdom connections, some power relationships in your life? The right people. Everybody say the right people. But secondly, it's about the right place. God said to the prophet Elijah, a famine is coming. Go to the river Cherith. I've commanded the ravens 
to feed you there. Notice it's a specific place. If he had gone anywhere else, the ravens would not have fed him. If he had gone anywhere else, he would have starved to death. God said, my blessing is connected to a place. And I'm telling you, Elijah, I'm going to provide for you, but you've got to go there where the blessing is. Well, I can just go anywhere I want to and everything's going to work out. You're absolutely wrong. Had he gone anywhere else, the bird, the Bible said, brought in one claw meat and in the other claw bread every morning and every evening. Can you imagine? But if you're over here and God said the blessing is going to be over there, then the blessing will go over there and you'll sit here in tremendous need. But over there, if you go where you're, God has a there for you. A there is a place of provision. When you get in that place, God will provide. He'll use dirty birds. He'll use, don't think everybody who's going to bless you is going to be a Christian. The raven was an unclean bird, but God said, I'll use that little dirty bird. And he'll, you know why he was a dirty bird? Because I believe he was picking the bread. They're in a famine. Where is he getting meat and bread from every morning, every night? And only one rich enough to eat bread and meat is Ahab and Jezebel. They would put it on the table and the dirty bird would rip it up and take it and feed the prophet. You get in the right place and God will make the devil bless you. He'll make dirty birds bless you. He'll make evil business people who thought they were going to cut you bless you. Oh, hallelujah. You can't curse what God has blessed. And when a man is in the place where he's supposed to be, the enemy cannot stop the blessing. And boy, I tell you, he just sits back and every morning, every evening, the raven just, just like UPS, just <laughs> drops it off right there into the frying pan. He says, thank you very much, Lord. I give you the praise. And he eats his steak and eats his bread and eats his steak and he's getting fatter and fatter. Everybody else is getting thinner and thinner, but he's just eating and eating because he's in the right place. But then the Bible said, and I, I could just see him in my mind just when he thinks, I have really got this down. I got my frying pan out. I got the fire built. And I'm just going to have to teach the body of Christ how this is done. How to get the birds to feed you and the river to flow in the middle of the famine. That's going to be my number one New York Times bestseller. And I'm going to put out a brand new teaching series on it. And just about the time that he thinks he's got it down, the Bible said the brook dried up and the bird quit flying. God was saying to him, when the brook grows dry, it's time to go back to your source. Your source is not the brook. Your source is not the bird. Your source is God. And if you're in relation, don't go to God for, what you, for a miracle. Go to God for a relationship. If you have a relationship with him, then I got news for you. You'll have a miracle every day of your life. It's all connected to him. I'm talking about, I'm talking about places of blessings, places of blessings, Zarephath, Cherith, places of blessings. The Lord spoke to me in this and he said, notice in the story of Elijah and Elisha, Elijah, Elisha said, I want a double portion. Elijah said to him. If you're with me in the right place, at the right time, with the right person, when I go up, the mantle will fall and you'll get double portion. But it's dependent upon you being in the right place with the right people. And I'm the right person. I'm a power relationship, Elisha, in your life. And you can get offended at me. You can get mad at me. You can get hurt at me and leave, but you won't get where you're going five years from now. You'll still be sitting outside your destiny because you better learn to respect the power relationships that God puts in your life. And the scripture said that as soon as he said, you want it? Be with me in the place where I am when I'm taken up. You'll get it. And the Bible said, I love this text. The Bible said, and Elisha broke the plow. 
did it on purpose. That plow was how his family for generations had provided. But sometimes when God's going to do something magnificent in your life, it will require of you to break the plow. It will say, I know this is your form of security. This is your form of, of, of self Blessing. This is what you've depended on. This is how God's always done it. But there is a double portion that is available when God tells you to break the plow. So he follows him the first place they go. Real quick, I want to go through this and I'll close. Right place. Follows him to Bethel. Bethel is where God gave Jacob a vision of the house of God. And he saw angels ascending and descending. If you want a double portion, if you want the right place, you got to have the right appreciation for the house of God. And it tells me this, Bethel means house of God. God showed him angels ascending, descending. It tells me, and then Jacob made a powerful statement. He said, I have found the gate of heaven. Do you understand that your church is the gate of heaven for your life? Do you understand that God will do for you in a place and setting like this? The heavens are open and angels are descending while we're preaching and ascending and they're taking needs up and sending blessings down. And it doesn't happen with you doing your own thing. When God assigns you to a house, it's a place of blessing. It is the gate of heaven and you don't need to treat it casually. You don't put other things ahead of it. It's the gate of heaven for your life. Angels notice if you're in church. Got proof of that. Read your Bible. Read the story of Jacob. Secondly, he's got an appreciation for the house of God now. Then he goes to a place called Gilgal. Gilgal was where Israel had to be recircumcised. Have you ever thought of circumcision and got a happy feeling about it? Notice that sometimes the place of blessing is a place of pain. That when God is going to do something, we don't always think that the place of blessing is a fun place, is an enjoyable place. Sometimes it will hurt to be in the place of blessing. You get your feelings hurt. You get your emotions hurt. You get your, you get your mind hurt. You want to give up and quit, but stay where God tells you and get a hold of your flesh and say, you know what? You're not going to talk me out of what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to, and God is, God is getting you ready. See, he gets you in love with his house. He gets you dealing, putting away with, of the flesh, dealing with the flesh, that anger, that bitterness, that gossip. You, you start little by little dying to that stuff. Then he takes him to Jericho, and Jericho is where he saw a vision, Joshua did, for the city. God gives you vision as, as you're in the right place. You get in the right place, and God will begin to give you vision for your life. The right place. He was in the right place. The right people. Give me two minutes, and I'll finish this sermon. The right plan. It's so critical to understand that one plan from God, one idea from God can change your life. God is an entrepreneur that wants to bless you. He can give you one idea. One idea from God is better than 10,000 philosophies of man. One idea can change your world. When you need a miracle, God will give you a plan. And it's going to be scriptural so that when you look at that plan, you know you have the divine right to it because it's in the Word of God. When He gives you that plan, if it's not in line with the Word, it's not from Him. And secondly, with that plan will come a set of instructions. God said to Joshua, you're the right man in the right place. Now here's the plan, march seven times. And on the seventh day, seven times and blow trumpets and shout and the walls will fall down. But it wouldn't have happened. Not just the right place, not just the right people, the right plan. God's plan for the family is one man with one woman. One dollar out of ten. I said one dollar out of ten is God's plan. One day out of seven is God's plan. Follow the plan and you'll get the miracles. Wedding of Cana, bring the pots, pour the water. I'll turn the water into wine, but here's a set of instructions. Here's a plan. Do you need a miracle? God has a plan. And I close with this thought, but Malachi 3, he said, prove me. 
For if you want to know I'm up here, throw me a seed and I'll throw you back a harvest. If you want to know if I'm real, I dare you, believer or unbeliever, begin to honor me with the tithe and the offering and see if I will not, listen to this, see if I will not open up the windows of heaven, which means you're either living under an open heaven or a closed heaven. Imagine every day, do you want, I want to ask you a question, do you this week want to live under a closed heaven? Heaven is shut up, closed. Or it's open, and the Bible said it happens according to how you obey the instructions concerning your giving. I don't want to go all week long with a closed heaven. I want an open heaven because it's not just money. I get peace. I get joy. I get instructions. I get kingdom connections. I get blessing people. I get, I get power relationships. I get all that God has for me when I'm under an open heaven. How many of you need a kingdom connection? How many of you need a power relationship? How many of you are lonely and you're ready for God's will? How many of you today need somebody to put you in where you've tried to get in and you can't get in? How many of you feel like God's saying break the plow? How many of you feel like the, the, the creek has dried up and God needs to give you a new set of instructions? You're in the right church today. I feel with great authority to tell you the right people are coming. God's going to put you in the right place. It's going to astound you. And he's going to give you a specific plan and set of instructions. If you follow it, he will bring his will to pass for this season in your life speedily. In Jesus' name. I still believe the Holy Spirit has some incredible plans has some new people, some kingdom people that are really supposed to enter your life. I still believe the Holy Spirit has great ideas, a great plan that he's ready to release. Just one idea can take you to the mountaintop. One idea can change society. One touch from Jesus can change everything. If you don't know him as your savior, I'm gonna invite you to pray this prayer with me right where you are. Say these words, Jesus, I love you. I need you. Thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you for the blood that you shed. And today I receive you. I receive you as my Savior. The, the first right person in my life is you, Jesus. And I give you control of my life. Just say that. I give you control of my life. In Jesus' name, forgive me and cleanse me. I am yours. Amen and amen. Now listen, if you just prayed that prayer, we would love to hear from you. Go online, pick up the phone, dial the number that's on the screen, or write us and let us know what God has done in your life. We want to help you in your new walk with Jesus. I don't know a better opportunity to share in God's plan right now than helping the survivors of the Holocaust living in Israel. I believe that right now, if you understand what we're doing, you'll want to be a part. You see, there are 190,000 survivors living there. 50,000 of them live in utter poverty. Some are even homeless. And you and I have the unique opportunity to help build two special assisted living facilities in Israel where we will clothe and house and feed these Holocaust survivors free of charge. And it will provide safe, secure housing for these elderly survivors. Jesus said in Matthew 25, when you do it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. That's the Jewish people he was talking about. When you invest and bless Israel, he said in Genesis, the 12th chapter, I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you, Israel. If people bless you, God himself says, I'll bless the people that get involved in projects just like this. And I want to encourage you today. I'm believing for 500 people to give a one-time gift of $1,000. I want to challenge you right now to be one of the 500. And I know that's a lot of money. You know us. We're a member of the Evangelical Council of Financial Accountability. We submit our finances every year to a big organization and they make sure every penny goes exactly where it's supposed to go. So I'm not asking for myself. I'm asking and you know we do what we say with the resources that you trust us with. Here's my announcer to tell you how you can be a part of this amazing project. To many, the Holocaust seems like a horrific chapter in history. But to the 190,000 survivors in Israel that experienced the horrors of the Nazi death camps, 
it is their personal story. Sadly, more than 50,000 of them continue to live in poverty, some even homeless. Kingdom Connection friends and partners have always responded to the poor and needy, and now we are partnering with Friends of Zion to build two assisted living facilities, one in the heart of Jerusalem. Your gift of $1,000 will provide our Jewish brothers and sisters with a safe place to live where they can experience the care and compassion that meets their needs. With your one-time gift of $1,000, we'll place your name on a special founder's wall at both buildings in Israel. And as a special gift of appreciation, we'll send you a personalized crystal plaque. When you send your gift of $100 or more, we'll send you a special founder's certificate honoring your investment in Evans, and we are paying for the renovation of this massive complex. You and I together are making this miracle happen. I want you to watch this. I want you to pray about what you can do. Jesus said, as you do it unto the least of these, my brothers, what? Do what? As you feed them, as you clothe them, as you provide housing for them, you do it unto me. You can actually impact the Lord Jesus Christ by blessing the nation of Israel. Watch this, and then we'll go right into the service. The Holocaust ended more than 70 years ago, yet there are still tens of thousands of elderly people who experience the horrors of the Nazi death camps. And today, there are about 190,000 of them still alive in Israel. Unbelievably, more than 50,000 of them continue to live in poverty. God has placed it in our hearts to do what we can to help. We are partnering with Friends of Zion to build two assisted living facilities in the heart of Jerusalem. Your gift of $1,000 will provide our Jewish brothers and sisters with a safe place to live. With your one-time gift of $1,000, we'll place your name on a special Founders Wall at both buildings in Israel as a reminder for years to come of the love and compassion that you have shown. And as a special gift of appreciation, we'll send you a personalized crystal plaque. When you send your gift of $100 or more, we'll send you a special Founders Certificate honoring your investment in this project. And everyone responding will receive this CD teaching, It's Time for a Comeback. Every gift, no matter the size, will help accelerate the vision. And together, we can be a blessing to Israel. To learn more, call now or visit us online at JensenFranklin.tv. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them with me to the book of uh, Luke chapter 17. I believe I've got a message today that many, many, many people need to hear in this season in your life. Be made whole. I want to take just a moment and talk about the condition of these 10 lepers. I want you to lean in with me. I want you to let me have your imagination for just a moment. Everything that I'm about to tell you is not made up. You can check it out. It is absolutely accurate. Ten lepers, the Bible said, all suffering from the same disease, all facing a tragic death. There was no cure for this disease. All are outcasts from the temple. They are outcasts from their families. They have no communication with the public. They have no hope for tomorrow. They have nothing to look forward to. They have distorted faces. They have body parts that have fallen off. The, one of the first things to go would be the nose. And the nose is just lying there flat. And the lips would begin to drape. And the teeth and gums would be exposed. The, the, the lips hang down, distorted faces with, with disease on the inside. The bones begin to rot and then break off. They become brittle and just break off parts of the body. It's horrible. It's like a, the skin becomes mummy-like. Infection consumes the body. It takes the body parts furthest from the heart first. The fingers, the toes, they go first. And then it just keeps eating away till finally a spot. At first, you know, Naaman was a, was a leper in the body. Bible, a famous general, 
Syrian general and he hid his leprosy. The Bible said you can hide sin for a while, but before it's over, it takes over everything. It gets in your feet. It gets in your walk. It gets in your talk. It gets in every action of your life. You begin to be that. You can hide your sin at first, but it takes more and takes more. A little bit of the old you starts dying. That you that had convictions, that you that had a heart for God, that you that loved God, it just consumes you and it gets in every part of who you are and a little of you begins to die more and more and more every day. The disease makes it very clear that you are a leper and at some point they could not cover it anymore. The leper colonies were there because the people were banished and there was no cure so they separate themselves and they live with only those who are just like them. The final thing that sin does to a person is it causes them to pull away from all the good people in their life, all of the people who love God, all of the people who pray, and they want to live with people who have the same disease or sins that they have, and they feel comfortable. They no longer feel comfortable in that world where there's life and life more abundantly, but they're more comfortable with those who have the same disease. The lepers here that these 10 men in this horrible condition hear that Jesus, Jesus is coming to town. And faith comes by hearing. And when they heard the leper, the, when they heard the leper healer was coming, I don't know what they heard. Maybe they heard that he had touched a leper because he did in a previous chapter. He touched a leper. He touches the untouchable. Maybe they started saying that to one. Maybe they said he's no respecter of persons. Maybe they said somebody called him the great physician and we could get to him. But whatever it was they heard that made them leave their leper colony and run to Jesus, 10 of them without their noses and faces, some of them without ears, some of them on a bloody a stub of what could be called a foot that was only left and putrefied sores all over the body, but they're running to Jesus, 10 of them coming straight at him. They come to Jesus, their eyes would have turned to cotton because one of the first things that happens is they go blind. A leper will go blind. Zombies, zombies walking toward them with their noses flat, their teeth and lips uh, are, are exposed. Their, their, their sores are running. It's a horrible situation. And Jesus turns to them and they said, have mercy on us. And Jesus said to them a strange instruction. He never told anybody who ever got another healing miracle. The man at the, who was healed after 30 years at the pool uh, uh, of Bethesda, was, he didn't say go show yourself to the priest. He didn't say to other people, the blind man, the lame man that he healed, go show yourself to the priest. But the thing that he said to these men is, I want you in your condition. It's different from every other condition. Go show yourself to the priest. What he was saying was a doctor cannot help you. A counselor cannot help you. You need to go to the house of the Lord. You need to go to the temple. You need to get under the high priest. You need to hear the word. You need, you need some spiritual help. You've tried everything else, but now it's gotten in every part of your life. And the only thing that can change you is get to the priest, get to the temple, get to the house of God. And I love the scripture. The Bible said, and as they went, they were healed. As you just start coming back to church and coming back to God and coming back to the house of the Lord, it's just as you just keep coming. It wasn't instant. It wasn't total restoration. But as you, as they went, they were healed. I believe, I believe that as they, as they were going, they felt the, the, the sores dried up. Something happened. They knew, I have been healed. I have been healed. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Don't you know they were shouting? And they ran home, and I could see Mama in her apron as she sees her baby that she thought she'd never see again, and she runs out, and he says, Mama, I've been healed. Mama, I've been healed. And they're grabbing each other and holding each other. They never thought they'd get to touch each other again. But then the scripture said that one of them, one of them didn't go home. When he saw that he was healed, he turned back and fell at the feet of Jesus and began to worship him. Now I want to preach for just a moment because God cannot resist leper worship. 
How does the leper worship? The Bible said that there was a man when Jesus came off the mountain who had leprosy on another occasion who fell at his feet in his leprous condition and worshiped Jesus. What is he worshiping with? How, what is, what's that sound like? Thank you, Lord, that my nose has is gone. Thank you, Lord, that my skin is mummified. Thank you, Lord, that I don't have my fingers and my toes and I can't walk. I can't hardly get around. I, I, thank you, Lord. No. Here's what leper worship is. Leper worship is not praising God for what he has done. Leper worship is when you praise God for who he is. So many of us, we, we just praise God when he meets our needs and thank you for the house, thank you for the car, thank you for the promotion, thank you for this. I'm happy this Sunday because something good happened to me this week. But leper worship is the worship that God will never resist. And it's when you're not coming saying thank you for what you've done, but thank you for who you are. You are my Savior. You are my healer. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. You are my strong tower. You are my strength. You are my comforter. And and I worship you not for what you've done because sometimes we look our life looks like that leper scene there's nothing good going on pain is real hurt is real life is real and when it hits it turns your life ugly and in those moments you don't worship God because of what he's done or doing you worship him for who he is and every now and then Every now and then, you need to give God leper worship. Not because he checked the boxes off of your prayer list, but you give him leper worship because he is your redeemer. He is Lord. Every now and then, the whole church in all of our campuses need to break out in leper worship and say, if I never get another prayer answered, I want you to know you're worthy, Lamb of God. You're worthy because of what you did on that cross. You're worthy because you rose from the dead. You're worthy because you're my coming king. And I give you leper worship. And when you give him leper worship, he cannot resist your worship. He will not leave you like you are. And when he began to worship, the other nine went home. And listen to me carefully. It's very important to understand the power of worship. Because the other nine went home, but the effects of leprosy had taken stuff from them. They didn't get their toes back. They didn't get their ears back, their nose back. They still had, they still looked like what they had been through. But your Bible said when this man fell at the feet of Jesus and worshiped him, <laughs> That Jesus said, be thou made whole. The word whole is sozo, which means complete, unbroken, undivided. So many have lost so much, but when you begin to worship, God says, this is how you get all your losses back. When you turn that pain and that hurt and that emptiness into worship, and you worship me not because of what I'm doing, because you don't understand what I'm doing, but you worship me because of who I am. I'm in control. I'm a good God. Even when life isn't good, I'm still good, and I'm going to bring you through with victory. I wish somebody would give him praise right now. It can make you whole. Our God is a restorer of lost things. Come on. Praise him just a minute for who he is, not what he's done. Oh, I praise you. Oh, I praise you. Oh, I thank you. Thank you, Jesus. God can't resist that. Your faith has made you whole. The word whole means no lacking parts, unbroken, undivided, undamaged. All parts are restored. As he's worshiping, his nose comes back. What would that have been like? As he's worshiping, he just had a, maybe one, one finger <laughs> that he was worshiping. And as he's worshiping, boom, 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 boom. And God's restoring what the enemy has stolen from his life. Anger is not the answer. Worship is the answer. Uh, feeling sorry for yourself and sinking in depression isn't the answer. Worship is the answer. And when you begin to worship, God says, I cannot resist leper worship. I cannot resist people 
people who are going through hell, but they focus on who I am, not what is being done to them. But what I love about what Jesus can do for us is he can, he can say, I know you went through it, but you're not going to look like what you've been through the rest of your life. And see, people come in and they don't even understand. They come in and they say, well, those people over there, they, they've had the perfect life. Look at that preacher up there. He don't know nothing about real life. And look at all those people down there in the front and those people up there jumping around in the choir. They don't know nothing. I didn't have a daddy and I was abused when I was a child. And, and it's not that we haven't been through similar things. It's just we don't look like what we've been through because we begin to worship him for who he is. And he begin to restore the father that you didn't have the brokenness that you went through, all the things life tried to destroy you with, he turned them around and said, I'll raise you up in spite of it. I wish somebody would praise him. I'm going to quit in a minute. But I, I just feel like we need to hear this today. Your worship is powerful. Isn't that what he said he would do in the book of Joel? He said, I will restore the years, the enemy's stolen years, but I've got a word for the devil today. You're going to give us back those years. I don't know how. I don't understand it all, but I know if I will worship God, he will, God will arise, and our enemies will be scattered. Give him a great praise. I'm going to try to, your faith has made you whole, complete. It's not we didn't go through it. We just don't look like it. The Bible said that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar. He, he heated it up seven times hotter and a miraculous miracle took place. The Bible said when they were thrown into the fiery furnace, that he looked in and he said, did we not throw three in? He said, yes, sir. He said, then why do I see four? And the fourth one, one looks like unto the son of God. And he said, boys, would y'all please come up here and please leave that one down there. I don't, I, he's too hot to handle. Leave him in there. And the three boys came out of the fiery furnace and you'll miss this miracle if you're not watching. And the Bible said, and there was not a hair on their head singed. Listen. And neither did their garments smell of smoke. They went through the fire, but they didn't look like what they had been through because they worshiped in the fire. And when you worship in the fire, he restores you. And you don't look like some of us have been through the fire and are going through the fire. But when God gets through with us, our families, our lives, our marriages, our homes are not going to look like what we've been through. Doesn't mean we didn't go through it. It just means he has made us whole. He doesn't want you to look like what you've been through. That's why when the prodigal son started coming home, the father took off running and covered him. He said, I don't want you to look like what you've been through. You've been through the pig pen. You stink and look bad, but I'm going to cover you, put these shoes on. He, he came back looking like a businessman. Had the, had the ring, the, the business ring on his hand. He came back like he had been on a business trip, looking like a businessman. All he needed was a briefcase. And where have you been? They, they probably had to ask, where have you been? Because he didn't look like a pig pen. Because when God gets through with you, you won't look like what you've been through. I know you're going through grief. I preached three funerals, and we've had four in this church. One I did not get to preach, but three out of the four are parents who have lost children in their 20s. In the last two months, I preached four, three out of four of those funerals. And these families are walking through some of the darkest seasons. There's no quick fix to something like that, but what I'm trying to tell you is I don't know how, but if you'll turn that pain into worship, God knows how to restore our soul, to not just stop the spreading of leprosy and then us limp away, but to so heal us that we look back on it and it causes us to give glory to God somehow that in the middle of all of it, we found who his true identity was. And he will restore those loved ones to you too. 
If you could have seen Solomon's temple, one man did a study and actually did all of the gold, silver, all of the cedar wood, etc., 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 that was used. Over $1 billion was the cost. And if you had seen that marble and seen it, you would have, you would have said, oh my God, it's beautiful. But where did the gold come from? Where did the silver come from? Where did, where did all of it come from? Who, where did it come from? Did they just, did they hit a gold mine? No. Read your Bible. God said to David, your son is young and tender, Solomon. So I need you to go out and be a bloody man and fight the enemies of God and take their gold, take their silver, take their precious stones, take all their treasures, bring it back, dedicate it to me. It's not going to look like what it's been through. I'm going to get glory out of all that stuff out there in the world. I want you to bring it to the temple and it's going to build something that's going to bring amazing glory to me. And so if you, if you'd, if you'd have walked there through the building with Solomon, he would have said, yes, that's gold. Yes, that's silver. Yes. See those breastplate, that breastplate on that high priest is solid gold. And it's got 12 priceless uh, stones, just uh, unbelievable. Uh, uh, you, you, but David could have said, let me tell you where all that gold came from. See that mitre, that little crown on that high priest's head? I got that from a temple prostitute over there with the Hittites. And see that gold up there? I attacked the Amorites and took their gold and brought it back, sanctified it, and gave it to up, uh, and they used that. Oh, and see those stones? See that, see that emerald right there? I pried that out of an eye of a false god where the Hittites were worshiping and burning their children. I pried its eye out and put it on the breastplate of the high priest so that when he walked in the glory of God, he'd have all the tribes of the children of Israel represented. It didn't look like where it came from when God got through with it. And Jesus, the son of David, who was a bloody man, too bloody. Father God said, I need to build a temple. And Jesus, the bloody man, the son of David said, well, I could use her. I could use him. I could use her. I could use him. And Jesus found you in the world, pried you out of the gods of this world, out of the dens of this world, out of the sin of this world, pried you out, brought you back like royal diadems, consecrated, sanctified by precious blood, set you in the temple, set you in the choir, set you on the praise team, set you with ushering and praying for people. You don't look like what you... We, we, we ought to let you tell your story every once in a while because if, if y'all would be brave enough to tell your story, people's jaws would drop. You, I hear this stuff. They'll whisper to me, I was a crack addict. And, and I, well, Lord, how did you get to carry the offering bag? We ought to be watching you. How, how in the world? But I'm telling you, people don't look like what they've been through by the time the blood and the grace and the mercy of God gets a hold of them. If you will worship, he will pour Pour out his spirit on you and he will bring glory to his name because of what he's done in your life. He'll make you whole. I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to you today, be made whole. You don't have to look like what you've been through. You don't have to carry the shame of the past. You don't have to carry the abuse, the hurt, the fiery trials and trauma that you've been through. He knows how to make you whole. It doesn't come through anger. It doesn't come through lashing back at people who've hurt you. But when you turn back like that leper and you begin to worship, he pronounces, you're not just cured and your sins forgiven, but you are healed. You are made whole. I speak that over your mind, your body, your life, your relationships. Father, I pray today for every person watching this program that they would be healed, that they would be delivered, that the sin, like leprosy that's been spreading, would be stopped and total restoration would come to people's homes, families, and lives in Jesus' name. Now, you need 
you need to call that number that's on the screen or go online. Get in touch with us today. Tell us what God is doing. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you just prayed that prayer with me. All he's waiting on is for you to say, Jesus, come on in. Just say those words, Jesus, come on in. And then tell somebody. I believe today the, that God has begun the miracle. As they went, they were cleansed. As you go in faith, God's going to do great, great things in your life. In our closing moments together, I want to remind you of the miracle that we're a part of right now as I speak. There is a piece of property in the heart of the city of Jerusalem that we're renovating, and we're going to put Holocaust survivors where we will house them, clothe them, feed them. We we'll partner with Friends of Zion and Dr. Mike Evans, and I want you to be a part of this miracle. Will you pray today? about giving a one-time gift of $1,000. We need some people to really step up and make this project happen. I'm gonna do it, I want you to do it. And man, one day maybe you'll get to go to Jerusalem and actually see a permanent house that you have provided for people who could not provide for themselves. And they're actually the descendants of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Wow, what a blessing. Thank you so much, watch this. The Holocaust ended more than 70 years ago. Yet, there are still tens of thousands of elderly people who experience the horrors of the Nazi death camps. And today, there are about 190,000 of them still alive in Israel. Unbelievably, more than 50,000 of them continue to live in poverty. God has placed it in our hearts to do what we can to help. We are partnering with Friends of Zion to build two assisted living facilities in the heart of Jerusalem. Your gift of $1,000 will provide our Jewish brothers and sisters with a safe place to live. With your one-time gift of 